Well, here at last. I've wanted to come here. So oh, it's oh, wow. Oh, look at it, Carl. It's beautiful. Thousands died from the infected blood scandal. And many are remembered at this church. Book of Remembrance here. Is it? Collins, I feel a bit tearful, actually. It is emotional. It's emotional to see his name there. Colin and Janet's son is one of the youngest victims. Oh, bless your baby. This wasn't an accident. It could have been avoided. The truth will come out. I like this candle for him. He's one of 30,000 people infected by contaminated blood products. Decades on, families are still seeking justice. So you call. Uh. justice for the people who've been ignored with no respect or compassion from the government. It's not about the money, of course, money. money. This shocking story began in the 1970s. It's been described as worse than the post office scandal. Terrible and shocking that that was. The infected blood inquiry is on another level. I was really, really bloody angry because I thought he's got away with this. We trusted these doctors. Whatever they said, we would do. We investigate the Welsh doctor at the heart of it, as well as the pharmaceutical giants and key politicians from the time. I just hope to God it never happens again. Do they have blood on their hands? It was like playing Russian roulette. There was a period when we were exposing patients to clearly horrific risk. Saving pennies again. Basically, treat them on the cheap. To us, it was murder. <sighs> we got on a table. At Colin and Janet's home in Newport, the family are surrounded by memories of their son. Oh, wow. Do you know what? This is all so... That was Colin's pet well card. That was the loads of little... They all loved Colin so much, didn't they? Their youngest child, Colin, was diagnosed at four months old with the condition haemophilia, which affects how the blood clots. There's his little medical book that he used to have to carry everywhere with him. He was only a baby. He was, you know, I didn't realise what bleeds he would have, what joint bleeds meant you know, and how painful they were going to be. How did it begin to, to affect his daily life? They told us, basically, keep an eye on him, wrap him up. You can't do that. You've got three brothers, he wants to... They told us to wrap them. him like in cotton wool. Colin was treated at the University Hospital of Wales in Cardiff under the care of Professor Arthur Bloom. He was one of the UK's leading haemophilia doctors. We were elated. We were really chuffed at the time, because yeah. he was a, a world leader in haematology. And he says, if you're going to be diagnosed as a haemophiliac, you couldn't pick a better time, because modern treatments are brilliant. At just 10 months old, Colin was given the pioneering drug Factor 8. 
It's the clotting agent. The injection puts it back into his blood. It was introduced worldwide in the 1970s. It meant much shorter treatment, and it cut down lengthy hospital visits. It was actually a life changer. We were down the hospital sometimes three or four times a day before we started the home treatment. And after that, it was normal life. Yeah, it's you amazing. Know. Britain became reliant on imported blood products from America in the 1970s and 80s because of a shortage in the UK. But big US pharmaceutical companies often paid donors for their blood. In commercial blood banks like this one in the Times Square area, donors receive around four pounds for a pint of blood. Health officials fear this financial reward may encourage contaminated blood donations from certain high-risk groups, particularly from intravenous drug users. It meant those who sold their blood for cash were often likely to be carrying infections. But those dangers weren't known to patients who were given imported blood. With convenience came risks in a scandal that spanned almost half a century, resulting in thousands of deaths. Finally, an inquiry to which thousands have given evidence, and many victims have kept secrets for decades. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give, that the evidence I shall like 80 year old Gerald Stone, truth, truth. who didn't reveal his condition for more than 30 years. You didn't tell your work colleagues, you didn't tell your children or your wider family members. Nobody. Back home in the Rhondda Valley, Gerald takes a product called Factor 9, a variation of the clotting drug for his type of haemophilia. So it's a lot easier now taking the drugs, is it, than it uh, used to be, I imagine? This is them, is it? That's the factor nine, which I now have once a week. So this is and that, that that is man-made product. That is now a lot safer, and it enables you to lead a, a much better life. Compared to how this used or to be. Or compared to 40, 50 years ago, where you had four pints of plasma in hospital overnight, and then go back to work the following morning. So these are your current records, eh? Yeah, these are current records. Since 1976, he's kept records of his treatment, which was also under the care of Professor Bloom. When I started having home treatment, um, we had to keep a record of the blood product to treat myself at home. But all of these are British, British, British? Yeah. In 1985, his treatment was suddenly switched. I was told that there was, uh, they now had an American product, which was considered safer than the British products. That's that batch number there? Yes. And what, was that the only American batch you received? Yes. But then in January, I was then told that oh, they were now happy with the British product and put me back on the British product. Do you know why you were, A, put on the American product, but then taken off it just three months later? I don't know. They didn't tell you? Oh, no, I, I was just told it was considered safer. Who was telling you that? Was it Dr that, Bloom, was it? Uh, Professor Bloom. This improved my life no end, you know. In fact, the dumb stuff was contaminated was the problem. The drugs companies making these products pooled tens of thousands of blood donations, so just one infected donor could contaminate an entire batch. The World Health Organization was so concerned that it advised stopping imports of blood products from countries with high rates of hepatitis, like the US. The Health Secretary, David Owen, pledged the UK would make its own blood products and stop the imports. We will be spending about half a million in all, and slowly we will be able to build up our own production facility. 
I was based here from 1978 until 1986. Professor Edward Tuddenham was treating haemophiliacs at this time. David Owen had announced the government policy for self-sufficiency, which was the World Health Organization um, uh, recommendation. But that quietly got dropped and on... Why do you think that was dropped? Cost. Cost. It was just cheaper to import from America. It was clear that there was hepatitis being transmitted and that it was apparent by the late 70s. So we knew that blood products were infectious, particularly factor eight made from a large number of donors, anywhere from 10 to 50,000. Doctors believed the benefits of these products outweighed the risks. Our patients with haemophilia get bleeds that kill them if they're not treated. Clearly, well, we should just have stopped and waited to eliminate the risk. But worse was to come. A terrifying disease was emerging. In America, this new disease has already become an epidemic. It was AIDS. And it wasn't long before it arrived in the UK. That dreaded new disease, AIDS, has now reached Britain. This has been confirmed by the official watchdog, the National Communicable Disease Surveillance Centre in London. But how did this happen? We've sifted through documents and found that experts in the US tried to warn doctors here about the threat of AIDS. In March 1983, Bruce Evert from the Centre for Infectious Diseases wrote to Professor Bloom in Cardiff to warn about the risks from blood products. He confirmed there were 13 cases of haemophiliacs with AIDS in North America, and they'd all received factor VIII. On the 9th of May 1983, there was yet another warning. The head of the Communicable Disease Surveillance Centre for England and Wales wrote to the Department of Health, urging the withdrawal of US blood products. But his letter was ignored. AIDS was soon claiming the lives of patients who thought they were being given life-saving treatment by the doctors they trusted. The fact that it's on the front page in those big letters is the same as any visual image. So it's hospitals using killer blood is ooh, shocking. Wake up, everybody, look at this. Journalist Sue Douglas exposed the dangers of American blood with her front page scoop in May 1983. So you need one person to say, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll say what's wrong. Her source was a senior figure who worked with Professor Bloom in Cardiff, where there was a suspected case of AIDS. He said, I'm really worried about the blood products that we're importing into the UK because we're getting them from sources that are suspect and there are lots of things that could go wrong. So was there any suspicion that people were being infected. And my conversation with um, the person in Cardiff was, yes, and there are doctors you could talk to. There were at least two people in London as well um, who had contracted AIDS because they needed blood treatment and transfusions. The Haemophilia Society called her article unduly alarmist. And Professor Arthur Bloom issued a statement saying it has not been proven that AIDS is transmitted by blood products and he was unaware of any proven case. Doctors supposed to 
save lives, and here I am, hospitals rather than doctors, killing people with contaminated blood. So of course they're going to complain. But what Professor Bloom didn't say is that he'd already reported a suspected case of AIDS two months previously. It was one of his own patients in Cardiff. 20-year-old Kevin Slater became the first haemophiliac in the UK to contract AIDS. With a case so close to home, other haemophiliacs started to fear the worst. At what point did you become worried about the products you were on? Or... In 1983. Why was that? That was when I read in work about the haemophiliac in um, Cardiff who had HIV. What, what did you do then? Well, I went down and questioned whether I had had the same batch. And the doctor that I spoke to at the time was just more concerned about where I got this information from, because they were virtually denying that there was a patient there, you know? In fact, I assumed I had HIV for a, about two or three years. Every time I had injection, it was like playing Russian roulette. Gerald didn't contract HIV. But more than 1,200 haemophiliacs were infected in the UK. One of the few survivors has now broken his silence. It's a secret he kept for more than 40 years, but he and his wife have now agreed to speak to me on condition of anonymity. Hello, Tom, Mag, how are you? Nice to see you. Hello, nice to meet you. Love, uh, talking to us. Tom and Meg are not their real names. We've lied to everyone in our family and our friends as well, so there's, there's no way this can come out now. Why did you feel the need not to tell the truth over those 40 years? In the beginning, it was because of all the backlash that was involved with it, and our children as well being in school. We thought they would be worse off than us, so we decided not to tell anyone. Tom had his first dose of American Factor VIII in 1978, when he was just 13. Were you told uh, at any point about any associated risks with, with the product at all? No, only when we went in when I was yellow with um, Hep A that uh, we were told to expect uh, jaundice a couple of times, perhaps with, with the treatment, but no mention of, of anything else at all. But on that point, do you remember when um, the, the risk of HIV and AIDS became an issue? When it came out in the newspapers about, uh, it was called the gay plague in those days, and um, we asked about it in the hospital, but no, nothing was nothing was really said about it. It was just don't don't worry about it. Who was that coming from? That was coming from Professor Bloom in Cardiff. When you saw those things, what, what did that make you...? Frightened us to death. Absolutely frightened us to death. That's literally there was right. when he was first diagnosed. Well, it was like just that. when he was infected, eh? And he's been affected at quite a young age, isn't it? I... Yeah, they said his first yeah. treatment. Despite a catalogue of warnings, in the summer of 1983, Colin Smith had his first dose of imported Factor VIII under the care of Professor Bloom. Were you told of any potential risk with Factor VIII? Nothing. We were basically said there was no risk. Nothing. No. I mean, it, you know, to us it was a miracle drug. Yeah. They were just infusing Colin and we believed every single thing that man said to us anyway. But we can now reveal that Professor Bloom ignored his own department's guidelines. That policy stated that children should only be given NHS blood products from the UK or less risky cryoprecipitate from a single donor.
This guidance was also shared with other top haemophilia doctors. But three months later, Colin was given imported blood anyway. Before Colin was given Factor Eight, Bloom had suggested that children shouldn't be given Yes, Factor but we didn't know that. We didn't that. know that at the time. It was only through notes. There's a cunt of, note, cunt of light since you we... You know, it was all, I'm telling was. you, it was all behind a curtain. Everything Bloom done was not face-to-face. -face. It was behind the scenes, if you like. What Prof said, what Prof done, we knew nothing didn't about. Didn't match up. We can also reveal that the drugs company, Immuno, which made Collins Factor Eight, used blood from America, which was known to carry a higher risk of serious infection. These documents show the UK was prepared to use it simply because it was cheaper. So Colin was, was given the American product. Yeah. Even though there was a higher risk of hepatitis with the American product, there was a preference in the UK because it was lower priced. Gosh. Colin and Janet were unaware of this until now. It is possible to sell factor eight concentrates produced from US origin at lower prices than European yeah. material because of the preference in the UK market for this lower price material. Money. Saving pennies again. It's basically treating them on the cheap. They weren't worried about people's health as far as I'm concerned. I mean, you get to a stage when you read things like that, to, to us, it was murder. Families like the Smiths are still finding out what was really driving the drugs companies. But for those treating patients, the motives were clear. What was the relationship between the pharmaceutical companies and purchasers in this country, in the NHS or, or in health, health authorities? In the case of the selling of Factor Eight, there were lavish, lavish inducements, as, as there were for other blockbuster products, with even then an annual turnover in the hundreds of millions, and now it's in the billions. At the end of the day, the bottom line is what matters they had a product that they were making a lot of money from. So there was a, a natural tendency to wish to carry on pushing that, even as the risk became more and more obvious. And they had stopped selling it in the US, but they had big stocks up piles that they were selling in the UK. And um, Even though they perhaps knew the risk? Although they knew the risk by then. The companies took a view that, the, almost a view that, well, the haemophiliacs are expendable, we'll just go on selling this product. Was that you? They were expendable, do you think that was there? Well, it, that's the only interpretation one can put on it. If you go on selling a product that you know is potentially deadly, just because you make a good profit from it, you've obviously rated your profit above the uh, health and actually the life of the people who have been given the product. The pharmaceutical company that made Collins Fact 8 was called Immuno. Now, it no longer exists, but the former marketing and managing director is still around. We've written to Peter Coombs on several occasions with important questions from our programme that we'd like him to answer. We've also tried to call him on the phone, but we've had no response. He did give a statement to the inquiry where he admitted there was a significant price difference between US and European Factor 8, but said he was not aware of any difference in quality. So we know what the drugs company's involvement was at this time, but what was the government doing? Margaret Thatcher had been re-elected after the Conservatives won a landslide majority. And Ken Clark was a health minister. He told Parliament there was no conclusive evidence that AIDS was being transmitted through blood products. He defended that stance recently at the Infected Blood Inquiry. And nothing but the truth. The line to take should have included an express recognition 
of the likelihood or probability that AIDS could be transmitted through blood or blood. Oh, blood. really? I said, it's perfectly bloody obvious that everybody was working on that basis. It's just, this is a, just a drafting argument. Out of sight of the pitch. Lord Clark's junior minister, whose responsibilities included blood products, was Lord Simon Glen Arthur. Despite the public denials from ministers, Lord Glen Arthur did acknowledge there was an almost certain link between AIDS and imported blood products when he approved this draft leaflet for blood donors in June 1983. Haemophiliacs, though, weren't informed about the risks. The minister told the inquiry they should have been, but wasn't sure why it didn't happen. The dangers from infected blood were now causing real concern globally and closer to home. I think I used the expression that I thought this could be the first puffs of smoke from the volcano. Dr Peter Foster was a research scientist in Edinburgh. He decided to blow the whistle after he'd heard warnings from experts around the world. He says he repeatedly wrote to his trade union, which passed on the warnings to the UK government and specifically to Lord Glen Arthur. I have the letter that was sent by the Lord Glen Arthur on the 26th of August 1983, in which the Lord Glen Arthur says there is no conclusive evidence that AIDS is transmitted through blood products. And so I replied to that letter and I said, I disagreed with the Lord Glen Arthur. The evidence is very strong, and it seems to me that the government were just carrying on, and there was a real danger that the UK could become a dumping ground for uh, the, the United States companies to get rid of their non-regulated products. Scotland was already producing its own factor eight because of the risk of infection. And Dr Foster says his letters urged the UK government to do the same. It carried on through into 1984, that, that dialogue, and then, and then it came to an end. Um, where there was obviously no progress was being made. And I said that I thought that they were being complacent, that they should be doing a lot more to try and resolve the situation. And it's just a pity that he didn't take, um, take this seriously. And it wasn't just doctors and scientists who were asking questions. What about the political response to your story? It was just never addressed. So basically business as usual, which again I found profoundly worrying that no one was really doing anything. And in my research, I probably talked to, I'm guessing, 20 people and those in government as well. And nobody said, mm -mm, this isn't a problem. Everybody knew and everybody thought, what do we do about it? Do you think there was evidence that some people in power and in positions of authority were aware of pretty strong rumours and evidence that these blood products were causing the damage that you pointed out? Uh, completely, because before I published the story, um, I'd spoken to Ken Clark and other government ministers about it. When you see people like Ken Clark who give evidence, um, it, it was awful to see him there. Sadly, this tragedy is just appalling what actually happened, but what was she done? Just got out and said, we think it's important in the public interest that we tell you that you're going to die. He sat there and he was belligerent and he wouldn't even refuse to answer some questions at one point. Um, We're not going to go on all day like this, are we? He didn't show any respect at all for our plight, what happened, he just didn't want to know. It's not only politicians who they feel let down by. In 1983, newlywed and expecting a baby, Tom and Meg had a meeting with Professor Arthur Bloom. At that time, I was five months pregnant. 
he had a shock when we walked in because I'm Professor Bloom wanted me to have a termination, but he wouldn't give me a viable reason why. Only that he wanted to stamp out haemophilia. And I would have to have given, given birth to that child naturally. It wouldn't have been like a, an easy termination at all. You think Professor Bloom knew about the HIV? Absolutely. 100%. Because he was very, you could you could tell he was very very concerned the fact that I was expecting, and he was quite um, strong in his opinion, and I, I refused. At that point, crucially, you didn't know that you had HIV, did you? No. In 1984, the virus which caused AIDS was identified as HIV, and the government finally accepted proof that it could be carried by blood. A test was made available, and for haemophiliacs like Tom, they received the news they'd been dreading. There were like um, eight of us in the waiting room to go in to see him, and that's the first time we were told that we actually had it. And not to tell anyone, uh, that, was, that was the biggest thing that hit me, don't, don't tell anyone, keep we don't want to frighten people. Yeah. Um, keep it to yourselves. And... There's nothing can be done. There's no treatment available for it. So we're just going to have to sit it out and carry on as normal. What was your... What was the impact of that statement on you? Um, I couldn't speak, to be honest. We just looked at each other. The first thing um, Meg asked was, could, could the baby have HIV? Fortunately, the baby was clear of the virus. But there was more news to come. I didn't know at the time, but I, I was pregnant again. Because of the stigma in the, in the, the media and things, the unknown life expectancy with Tom. And the fact as well that he'd been a distinct possibility by what we'd been told is that, that another baby would would have had HIV and I, want, I couldn't put a child through that. I, I did have a termination immediately. That same year, the Smiths also received devastating news about their son. Colin was lying in bed, not well at all. And Professor Bloom um, stopped in the corridor and just said, he's HIV. I can remember getting really upset, but I don't know why, because it was never explained that well, it was is. a death sentence. Were you given any indication at that point how he'd contracted HIV, where it had come from? Yeah. No, honestly, nothing, nothing. But on top of the family's heartache, they believe that Colin's treatment was part of something much more sinister. I just think he was being experimented on. 100% for certain he was a pup, which is a previously untreated patient. You know, he just had to be diagnosed with haemophilia at the same time, these trials were starting up. And the next thing you know, he's got HIV. In January 1982, more than a year before Professor Bloom first treated Colin, he and a colleague wrote to haemophilia doctors. The letter called on them to give new heat-treated blood products to those who hadn't been exposed to the high-risk American imports, so-called previously untreated patients. The letter explains the previous trials on chimpanzees were no longer suitable and they needed humans to test on. They wanted to see the infectivity of factor eight to see if it needed any further heat treatment or other methods of purifying it. You know, they're playing Russian roulette with people's lives and they miscalculated and killed thousands. We've spoken to victims who were given infected blood, who say they were used as previously untreated patients. 
for com these commercial blood products. What, was this happening? And what can you tell us about that? This was happening, yes. At a, a certain point, if, if you're going to use humans as the um, experimental animal, I won't say guinea pig, the strictest possible ethical standards should apply. But back then, ethical standards were very loose, actually. We didn't have ethics committees. If you had an idea of a trial you wanted to do, you, you would uh, basically just um, write the protocol and discuss it with your colleagues and get on and do it. You can understand why these people felt that they were treated as guinea pigs or whatever. Yes, I can understand that, yes. And they, they weren't asked... It wasn't explained to them or their parents. So they weren't told of the risks? No. And who was carrying out this kind of work? Was it... I mean, you mentioned Cardiff. Was, was it people like Professor Bloom? Uh, but yes, yes. I think, I think Arthur would have been doing it. I... Um, see, I'm, I'm, a bit, I'm conflicted here. Look, Arthur was my mentor. I owe him everything. But... Decisions were taken then in circumstances that it's hard to imagine and with different, different standards. I, you know, I'm certain that he would look back on it the way we look back on it now, in the same way, with great regret that there was a period when we were exposing patients to clearly horrific risk, but we didn't appreciate them or make the correct calculation of risk benefit. By the mid 80s, cases of AIDS were increasing and the media attention intensified. There is now a danger that has become a threat to us all. It is a deadly disease and there is no known cure. If you ignore AIDS, it could be the death of you. As I said, we used to live there. Where the footpath was it, Tanya? Yes. It was a lovely, lovely place. You know, and everybody knew each other. Colin and Janet have returned to where they used to live with their son when his AIDS diagnosis became public. How did it become known, at Colin? Well, you, you started having the adverts on the TV about AIDS was coming to the forefront of everybody's knowledge then. Uh, and I made a mistake of telling a member of my family. So the next thing you know, it's all over Newport. So yeah. we got out of hand then, we started having these phone calls. We'd have phone calls, Friends. 12, 1 o'clock in the morning. How can you let him sleep with his brothers? He should be locked up, he should be put on an island. And you're talking he was three? One day we got up and it says AIDS dead, written right across the side of the house. Black paint. We were known as the AIDS family anyway. It, it did affect your, your work life, didn't it? I yes, did it lose did. my job. I went in, they said, well, we don't want customers finding out because we lose customers. So I was laid off. Every house was getting an AIDS leaflet and, and you know, you read that, all you're going to say is, a little kid over there's got this. Their doctor had previously sought to reassure the wider public. Even in the United States, it's been calculated that the risk of ordinary blood transfusion uh, of, of contracting AIDS is less than one in 100,000 transfusions. And I think the risk will be less and lower still in this country. So I think recipients of ordinary blood transfusions can uh, be reassured that uh, they can receive their transfusion without fear.
but many did contract deadly diseases from infected blood, and some didn't find out until many years later. 27,000 people in the UK were infected with hepatitis C from blood transfusions. Help me. Help me. And one of them is 67-year-old Kaz Chalice. I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease, which is a kind of lymphoma, in March 1992. And in order to be diagnosed, they had to give me a blood transfusion because I was pregnant and I was anemic. And then I wasn't diagnosed until over a year later with hep C. The worst was literally being so fatigued I couldn't turn over in bed. And the depression, and the depression that comes with it. I couldn't make commitments, couldn't make arrangements, constantly letting people down, not being a good enough mom, all that fear of inadequacy. It can take a while before it manifests itself, you know, it, it's, yes. it has, a, yeah. has a reputation, doesn't it? Yes. I think with me it was about 15 to 20 years before I really understood the effects. There's a huge amount of people out there who might have had a transfusion and they may be carrying hep C and they don't know. That's why it's called a silent and deadly virus, because it just takes a while to really start. For some people, they've got the fear of, of progressing to liver cancer. They live with that fear. They don't know when their time is up. None of us know when our time is up, but we do know that one every four days loses their life to this. That's the clotting factor itself. And the water is in this part of the syringe, which reconstitutes that there. For years, Gerald has lived with and is able to manage his haemophilia. But it was his treatment that eventually infected him. At what point did you find out you had hepatitis C? And what was the diagnosis? Well, they had uh, diagnosed it in the hospital from blood test. I was told in 1993. They knew in 1991. Uh, and that's when my first knowledge that I had anything wrong with me. Did they tell you why they didn't tell you for two years that you had hepatitis C? No. I asked the, uh, the doctor then, how long have I got to live? Because I was aware that patients would die in one after the other, you know. And he said, well, I can't tell you. Could be five months, could be five years. I never told my children, I never told my employers. The only people who knew was my wife. And I never told any friends, no friends, anybody. But it difficult to keep a secret for so many years? Yeah, that was difficult, that was. Um, particularly my, uh, my children. Every holiday was going to be the last holiday, you know. Where is this picture and what was the significance of this picture? It was... It was his last Christmas day. After fighting HIV for so long, Colin's illness had developed into AIDS. To watch your own child go downhill so fast is unbelievable. And the weight loss, you could see every sinew and tendon in his body, and you couldn't pick him up to cuddle him. No, we had sheepskin, we had to pick him up. Yeah. But uh, he's like a little old man. His parents had to fight to bring him home for his final days. I mean, how important was that last Christmas? Oh, it was wonderful. I've got no regrets at all. You know, I've got a picture of Colin at the table. 
with a bottle of champagne in his hand. He I, had a drip up his nose and he was really, really he looked, ill. He looked really ill, um, he, he had but, still had his sense of humour. Yeah. But we had, had a wonderful time. Colin Smith was just seven years old when he died. So what are your memories of being back here? Are they happy uh, memories? Are they well, mixed? Mixed. When I walk into the centre, I remember the boys and men I knew who are no longer with us. Looking back at this particular period, how, how do you feel about your own personal uh, role and, and responsibilities? With great regret. Uh, from actions that I took with others, patients of mine became infected and many of them died. We could have um, stopped uh, using those concentrates we could have done. And Do you regret that you didn't? We didn't. The, um, again, it was this risk-benefit ratio calculation which went badly wrong. Professor Tuddenham continued to work with haemophiliacs and was instrumental in making a safer synthetic factor eight that's still used today. We had a brass bust done in honour of him because we thought he was so brilliant. Professor Bloom was initially celebrated for his efforts in treating haemophilia patients. Until we found out what he'd been doing. So that's been taken aside because the hospital was scared it was going to get vandalised. Attitudes towards him changed as the true extent of the blood scandal became known. I'm angry, so angry that he's dead. You know, when we found out that he, he died, I was really, really bloody angry because I thought he's got away with this. As the full scale of the crisis began to emerge, people confronted politicians demanding answers and compensation from the government. By now, more than 1,200 haemophiliacs had tested positive for HIV and 107 had died of AIDS. Surely, Mr Speaker, they would urgently compensate haemophiliacs who have contracted the HIV virus. The government agreed to make payments to the victims without any admission of liability. But there was a catch. We had 20,000, I think it was back in the, um, the early 90s. And um, the government came out with this waiver to say that, uh, use the money. Um, if anything else pops up when you blood tests, you won't chase us for it. Sign on the dotted line. Tom, like many others, also discovered he was infected with hepatitis C. With that waiver, do you, do you think that's because they knew? They knew, absolutely. 100% yeah. they knew. But to sign that, we wouldn't claim anything else against it. Yes, no. yeah. Like, we, we were told about hep C, and I asked what, you know, what the bearing is on, on, on us through that, and they said, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. AIDS will have you far before Hepsi even rears his head. The infected blood scandal was a disaster on a global scale, claiming tens of thousands of lives. But unlike in some countries, here in the UK, no one has been held responsible. There have been two inquiries, but both concluded saying no one was to blame leaving victims and their families feeling furious. Yeah, we're all absolutely disgusted by, by this report. It led to more and more demands for a public inquiry into what happened.
After years of campaigning, the government finally agreed to an inquiry, chaired by the High Court judge, Sir Brian Langstaff. In April 2023, five years after this inquiry began, an interim report was published laying out the recommended compensation for all of those infected and affected by what happened. Gerald and Tom received £100,000 each last year as initial compensation, and others were hopeful too. Interim compensation. But today the inquiry's chairman recommended extending that to more people. It was a bittersweet moment, I think. You know, everybody have said to us, you're going to be quids in. It's got absolutely nothing to do with that. I'd give me my son back. That's what we all want. I've spent more than half my life chasing a government for this. A year on from the interim report, the government still hasn't acted on recommendations to extend compensation to people like Colin and Janet. Last year, MPs voted to force the government to speed up the compensation process. The eyes to the right, 246. The nose to the left, 242. <gasps> What was your reaction when you...? I'd been glued to the TV for four hours solid. I was so, so happy. It was so close. It was a milestone moment for Kaz Chalice, after previously being told she was ineligible for any compensation. You, you were infected um, quite clearly in 1992. For the uninitiated, why is that date so critical? Because they started screening blood donor blood for hep C in September 1991, they declared that nobody could possibly have got infected after September 91. So the cut-off date for any financial assistant is that date. Evidence from her doctor has now been accepted, but her application for payment is still being declined. They accept my clinician's evidence, yes, but they won't pay me, they won't include me. What would it mean to you to, to finally get some compensation? It's, it's the recognition. It's the not being told you're not worth it, you don't count. It's the justice, justice for the people who've been ignored. Efforts to speed up compensation are still going through Parliament, and so the 40-year fight for justice continues. I believe that this scandal to a criminal The government told us it intends to fully respond to the inquiry's call for wider compensation once the final report is published in May. But what about politicians from the time? Lord Glenarthur turned down our interview request, saying he'd given comprehensive evidence to the inquiry about the government's insistence there was no conclusive proof linking AIDS and blood products. A lot of people must have been um, considering this at um, senior levels within uh, the department, both on the medical and the administrative uh, chains of command within the, uh, the department. Uh, I and others relied on, on, on that advice, and it was not at the time, either by me or by anybody else that I'm aware of, a, 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 an intention to mislead him. Now his boss was the former health minister, Lord Clark. He didn't want to do an interview about questions raised in our programme, but we've still got a couple of specific points we want to put to him. So I'm going to give him a call. Hello? Hello, it's Wirra Davis here from the BBC in Cardiff. Uh, first of all, I'm recording this call. There's a couple of questions we'd like to put to you about the infected blood inquiry, so you've got a chance to, to respond. Uh, no, I'm 
not doing any interviews on the Bud Scandal inquiry, uh, certainly not before the report is published. So you don't want to respond to the families who feel that perhaps you showed them a, a lack of respect when you were giving your evidence to the inquiry? I have every respect for the plight. It was, a, it was a tragedy for all the people involved and the victims and the relatives of the victims, as I uh, expressed at the inquiry. I did lose my patience through the questioning at one stage. Well, that was a mistake for which I've apologised. We've also spoken to a journalist who broke the story that AIDS was being transmitted by imported blood. She says that you knew of the risks, but you and the government didn't act. I think she says the government knew, but that's what the inquiry is, is having, having a look at. In my time as, as, a, as a junior minister, I was never asked to take a decision on the subject. I never did take a decision on the subject. The colleagues who were dealing with it followed the medical and scientific advice from the experts who were giving it. With hindsight, it was obviously a terrible tragedy, and I'm not going to make any further comments on the subject until the inquiry produces a report, and I'm not sure I will then. Good clock. Thanks for your time. Goodbye. The inquiry has examined tens of thousands of documents at a cost of more than £100 million. And after a series of delays, the long-awaited report is due next month. More than 33 years after he was infected with contaminated blood, Gerald hopes he will finally see justice. Do you think you will live to see a conclusion to this? I'd be very surprised. I'm very surprised I've lived to 80. I've said all along, I don't think I'll see the end of it, you know. For Tom and Meg, it's a chance to move on from a secret that has dominated their lives. What do you plan to do after all this is over? It's never going to be talked about again and we just want to get on with our lives and put this behind us properly, something we've never been able to do. Well, I just hope to God it never happens again. And people are not in the same position that we have been in for over 40 years. And for Colin and Janet, hope that they can finally find peace for their son. Uh, this is uh, memorial, just messages from people who have lost somebody yeah. over the last 30, 40 years. They leave little messages uh, as an everlasting reminder of what they've lost. Daddy. Mummy. I feel better for the man. Put that in there, Colin. The thing is, we know a lot of these people. It's a tragic part of it, yeah. It's really sad. And it was all so avoidable. My closure will be when I can go up the cemetery and say, you've done it. That's what I want. It's over, Cole. We've done it, darling.